Thank you, everybody, for joining us in this week two of 10 questions. This evening's question is, what is time? One of our world's greatest photographers and a colleague here at UCLA, Kathy Opie, has said it this way, ideas always start with questions. Questions powerfully drive research uh, of all kinds today. Um, they dri it drives forward um, whether in the sciences, the humanities, in medicine, or the arts. Um, and arts indeed, and part of the predicate of this course is that the arts are a form of research. They're research into ideas and things that not only shape but become our world. Um, and if you'd allow me to take a few minutes here, I'd like to briefly introduce to all of you 10 questions and then introduce each of our terrific guests here with us this evening. So um, I am Brett Steele, uh, the host of this event here and Dean of the UCLA School of the Arts and Architecture. Um, and you are joining us uh, here at the school for a very special experiment in education and public programming. 10 Questions is both a lecture course with 80 students. Students, give me a shout out. Where are you? So we can see you're here. With students and this is a public event. Public, a show of hands, and thank you so much for coming in. This combination of class and public event gives us an opportunity to build bridges. Uh, to build bridges rather than reinforce walls between the university and the public whom we serve. We are striving here to make uh, the state-of-the-art uh, state education not only more visible, but literally more available in the world around us. In turn, by making UCLA more porous, we hope to communicate to you, our students, the importance of the work each of you are doing um, in the classroom and beyond. Each of the questions being asked in this series is drawn from the critical engagement of arts practitioners who we canvassed considerably for many months to come up with the list of 10 questions that have organized this course. The questions of space, time, beauty, freedom, memory, the body, failure, work, and knowledge are all central to artistic practices of all kinds today. By sharing these inquiries with not only artists, but also scientists, scholars, and activists, we genuinely believe that we are building a stronger foundation for understanding both disciplinary commonalities and different individuated perspectives. <clears throat> In this way, we hope to both build and develop an appreciation for the interdisciplinary, the interdisciplinarity that is so necessary for progress in this tightly interconnected 21st century universe that you all know so well. Over these 10 weeks, 10 questions will bring together 40 terrific faculty members across the entire UCLA campus. Students enrolled in this course include majors from the School of the Arts and Architecture, as well as neuroscience, biology, French, music, political science, and many, many other campus majors. In addition to being here Tuesday evenings, you students meet weekly with, graduate, with our graduate teaching assistants in the course, Kyle, Jingjing, Anna and Haley, who are here with us this evening, to respond to and discuss these questions, creating as well as curating your own individuated responses in a variety of different formats. 10 Questions is the brainchild of Victoria Marks, choreographer and associate dean in the School of the Arts and Architecture. Victoria is right here up front, everybody. Thank you. Nurturing and bringing this project to fruition with Victoria and to the broader public is the work of Anne-Marie Burke, sitting next to Victoria, right up here up front. <clears throat> Our school's executive director of communications and public relations, as well as her team, Kylie Kerrigan and Louise Kale. Jennifer Wells Green, our executive director of development, worked alongside Victoria and Anne-Marie to ensure that friends of UCLA were able to join in this unique project. Finally, Marilyn Pace offered her tremendous expertise in UCLA teaching to ensure that this moved forward in the form that it is. So thank you to all who've made that possible here within the school. And I know, like in any introduction, time is of the essence. 
But please, two more thanks here, very briefly, alongside Victoria and Anne-Marie. I wish to thank two vice provosts here at UCLA for supporting our initiative. Tim Brewer, our vice provost for interdisciplinary and cross-campus affairs, provided a seed grant initially to allow us to plan this work. And Roger Wakamoto, our vice provost for research, provided additional support, which when combined with our own efforts, has been able to make this event possible and more accessible. And finally, we thank the Department of World Arts, Culture, Dance for their enormous support for this terrific venue and for the considerable te technical expertise which is spread around the room as I'm speaking that makes an event like this possible. Um, and with that as a broad introduction, I'd like to briefly introduce each of our guests here this evening. Uh, Professor Rebecca Mendez, here on my left, um, joins us from the Department of Design Media Arts. Rebecca is an artist and designer who uses a variety of media to explore the nature of perception and media representation. She is especially interested in how cultures express themselves through the style of nature that they produce at any given time and the medium through which they construct this idea of nature. James Newton, professor, distinguished professor. James Newton joins us from the Herb Alpert School of Music is the Department of Ethnomusicology. James is one of the world's true flute virtuosos in numerous musical idioms. His work encompasses chamber, symphonic, and electronic music genres, compositions for ballet and modern dance, and numerous jazz and world music contexts. Associate Professor Asma Saeed joins us from the college's Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures. Asma is the program director is the program director of Islamic Studies. Her primary research interests are in early and classical Muslim social history, the history of Muslim education, the intersections of law and social history, and women and gender studies. And finally, UCLA Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost Scott Waugh is a scholar of medieval history who for the past decade has served as the chief operating and academic officer here at UCLA. Scott guides strategic planning, policy development, and campus-wide academic initiatives. He has previously served as the dean of the Division of Social Sciences in the College of the Letters and Sciences, where he holds a professorial appointment in the Department of History and where he will be returning full-time at the end of this academic year to focus on his scholarly research. So thank you, the four of you, for coming in this evening. For all of you for coming, we will follow a format uh, as we did last week in which each of our guests will give a brief uh, presentation. I will open up the floor to a discussion between our guests this evening. You all will be invited to join in this session, and I'm sure it'll be a terrific one. Thank you, everybody. And our first presentation this evening is Scott Waugh's. Oh, rats. OK. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, overly generous. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to see you all. I'm going to uh, talk about uh, how historians look at time, historians of modern Europe or European historians. Uh, this will give us two different perspectives on how historians look at time. I'm going to focus really on three issues that uh, European historians have looked at in a broad range of history of uh, European history. The first is uh, the technology of time, and that's the transition from bells to clocks to watches and so on, which has a long history in uh, the West and uh, all over the world. And that's one thing that people look at, and we'll see how that comes back at the end. The second is sort of the metaphysical notion of history. With the decline of the Roman Empire and the rise of Christianity, Christian conceptions of time kind of took over in the medieval West and dominated Western thought for a long, long time. The easiest way of seeing that is in the Bible as history. There's an Old Testament and New Testament divided by the coming of Christ and then with the prefiguring of the uh, uh, Last Judgment. That also opens up the notion of the uh, temporal versus the eternal, which was much on people's minds. The temporal, the post after the fall, after Adam and Eve, Man was, men and women were subject to all the vicissitudes of life and uh, subject to time. Whereas the eternal, which was the realm of God, 
it was not without, was without time, or could be conceived of as endless time, time after time after time. And the notion was, of course, the common notion was that that temporal age would end at the last judgment, everything would be brought together, and some people would enjoy eternity either up above us or below us, in heaven or in hell. And that was a kind of dominant theme. Another aspect of that that was very important was that the teleological aspect. People thought of history as having an end. Some, it was guided towards something. Things were either going to get better or, or they were going to get worse, but they were always going to an end, and that end was the end of time. So the Christian conception of time in the medieval West was very dominant, and it had really captured people's minds. It also captured people's minds in another way, which I'll come back to. And then finally, the third conception is the social and economic conception of time how society patterns time, or the vice versa, how time patterns social activities and work. And those were two very, very important issues. And they are the issues that really surround what became one of the central, has been one of the central concerns of European history for a long time, and that is modernization or industrialization. Now, modernization, industrialization is a process that lasted for centuries in uh, Europe. It is a process that is still going on around the world. You can think of it in simple terms as industry, factories, trade, globalization. But more importantly, from our standpoint here in this group, it also requires a radical restructuring of time, a movement from pre-industrial to post-industrial time. And those are two radically different regimes. In order to show you how radically different they were in the European West, I'll focus on, the, to begin with, pre-industrial time, agrarian time, the time dominated by the work of the fields, the work that the majority, the vast majority, 99, 95, 99 percent of the population enjoyed or worked in during their lives. So it's that uh, early aspect that I want to think about. And when you think about agrarian time, you have to think about daytime because night was absolutely dark and the possibility of falling into a cesspool, stepping on a plow, uh, getting rolled over by a cart was all too common, so you didn't go out after dark. You were too poor likely to have candles even. So most of the European West was really dark. So we're talking about daytime. And daytime was structured by work. You count the way in which you organized your day, the way in which you thought about your day was according to the tasks you did. Now, uh, how many of you are horse racing fans? Okay, how long is a furlong? You don't know. Eighth of a mile. Eighth of a mile. Well, that's almost correct. It's the distance that a plow team could go in a straight line before it had to turn around and come back again to plow the other side. That's where it's a furrow long. Now, given that, and given, up, given that several furrows make an acre, how big is an acre? Oh, God, you're so post-industrial. <laughs> an acre is the amount of land that a plow team could plow in one day. OK? Now, that's somewhat irregular if you think about it. If you plow in heavy clay soil, you're only going to be able to plow a little bit. If you're plowing in light, sandy soils, you're going to plow a lot. So an acre, which is a day's worth of work for a plow team, varied from one place to another. That irregularity is what characterizes pre-industrial time and pre-industrial work. It's not divided by time. It's divided by the tasks you have to do. And there's no real division between life and leisure, work, and things that you need to do. It's irregular, and that kind of irregularity dominates the way in which people live. Villages were organized around churches. The church bell rang the morning, rang this evening, rang when you had to go to mass, didn't tell time. You didn't have any timekeeping as such. You had the sun, you had the cock crow, and you had basically your work. And that was the way in which the rhythms of life were set. Sunrise, sunset, and the various seasons that went with it. The calendar, the annual calendar, was likewise dominated by the rhythm, rhythms of agriculture, the rhythms of what you did daily. Sowing, reaping, hoeing, <coughs> harvest, or it could be pasturing, lambing, shearing, butchering, and all the things that you did in a pastoral world. 
But those were the activities, the kinds of things you did, and that's how you told time. You told the seasons according to what you had to do when you needed to do them. On top of that, there were also, and most people thought about, not just the, the tasks they had to do or the seasons, but they also thought greatly about the Christian calendar, the feast days. Time was marked by great feasts, not feasts in the sense of a lot of food, but celebrations of saints. St. Bartholomew, you'll hear about St. Martin. We only have left pretty much Christmas and Easter from those times, but every week and every day had a saint associated with it, and as we'll see, that's how they told time. So work, life, feast days, that's what structured people's memory. That's how they came to locate themselves in time, historical time, if you will. So I want to illustrate that by some quotes. Which we don't, one of the problems of doing pre-industrial work is that the people didn't write anything, and they didn't leave diaries, they didn't write letters. So we have to kind of get at, triangulate, and get at them from other ways, what they were thinking about, what there was going on in their minds. And one of the ways we get in their minds was in England, uh, uh, coming of age was a very important time. You came of age if you were a man at 21, a woman at 15, 14 or 15. And that was important because at those ages you could inherit land. And the king was very concerned about that, who was inherit land that belonged to him. And so he had a whole system set up called proof of age. So if you think you're 21 years old, the king would set up an inquest, which was a jury, and the local neighbors, 12 of them, would get together and testify as to whether or not you were really 12 years old or you were 15 years old or whatever it was. And so we have records of that that say these proof of ages. And you'll see that they're not exactly what you think. So I've got one. Fortunately, there were two juries, two inquests, which were held a three months apart, one in October of 1303 and one in October, in January of 1305. Let me just go through this very quickly. Uh, the uh, first one was for John, son and heir of Richard Tempest. Here's what they said. William de Martin, age 60, says that the said John was born in Braceville on the day of St. Bartholomew, which is, you're right, 24th of August, 21 years ago. And he was baptized in the baptistry of the Church of St. Michael there, and he recollects the day and the year because on the exaltation of the Feast of the Holy Cross following, right, 14 of September, his son Patrick was born who was 21 years old at that feast last. Robert Buck, aged 41, agrees and recollects because he was in school at Clitheroe. And on the morrow of the nativity of St. John the Baptist, 25th of June, <laughs> next before the said birth, he was so badly beaten at school that he left school. And from the, the day of that beating, it was 21 years on the same morrow last past. What's missing from those accounts? What would you normally have if you were saying, you think, 21 years ago, what's missing? A year. A year. There's no calendar year. No day of the week. There are feast days. There's events. That's the way you pattern your time. You think about where you were according to what the feast day was and according to what uh, 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 the, uh, the whatever. <laughs> uh, so the next one, the next... Uh, I lost the train of thought there. That happens when, I, uh, we'll see that in a second. Emma, the wife of Richard Fovell and the daughter of Elias Ruth, this is the one that's three months later. This is the inquest, okay? So one of the interesting things is this inquest was held in the same town, Skipton upon Craven. Lovely town, you should visit it. Um, Emma was the daughter of Elias de Rilliston. Elias de Rilliston died in 1295, and at the time of his death, and the, the inquest determined that his heirs were his daughters, Emma, aged three in 1295, and her sister Cecily, aged three months, who disappears. So we fast forward nine years. Nine and three is 12. So we would expect the jury to come out in 1304 and say 12 years old. John de Keeley, age 50, says that the said Emma was born at Fleshby on Sunday before St. Peter in Cathedra, 22nd February, 15 years ago, and was baptized in the baptistry of the Church of St. Andrew, Cargrave, and this he recollects because at the Feast of St. Martin, 10th of November, before that, he leased a certain land for a term of years whereof at the Feast of St. Martin last 15 years had elapsed, and so the indentury at a document shows. So the document shows that um, he, that's accurate, but... He says that she's 15, but clearly she's 12. 
John was one of several men on both juries, and you can compare their testimony. Remember Robert Buck, the guy who was beaten so badly? Well, at the time uh, he was, uh, gave the first testimony, he was 41. When he came back in January, he's 38. Uh, <laughs> he recalled in October, John's age, uh, a few months later in January, he agrees that Emma is 15. And he recollects that because Adam Buck, his father, died 12 years ago at the Feast of Ascension next, and the said Emma was then three years old, and he was in the church the day she was baptized. More interesting is the testimony of Elias de Stretton, age 70 in the first inquest. This I love, having just turned 70. In the second inquest, he's 60. In the first, he agreed that John was 21 years old because he recollected that his wife, Annabelle, died at the Feast of St. Martin, 10th of November, 10th of November, after John's birth 21 years ago. He's been a grieving widower for 21 years. In the second, in January, he agreed that Emma was 15 years old because he recollected that his wife, Annabelle, died 12 years ago at Christmas last and on Sunday before the Feast of St. Peter in Cathedra following. The said Emma was three years of age. Now, Elias was actually in the jury in 1295 that testified that she was three years old in 1295, but he says, no, she's 15 years old. So the point here is that this is a kind of little window you can have under the way in which people thought. We all look at our watches, we look at our time, and gradually, as these jurors were talking, time was changing. They were establishing work bells in cities to get cloth workers to work and appear on time and when they could take meals and when they could go home. Very small portion of the population, but that's the start of it. From work bells, you get clocks in towns. The clocks tell the workers in the towns, the cloth workers, the leather workers, the beer makers, the beer brewers, and all of those people, when they can work and when they can leave work, when they can eat, when they stop eating. Then you start getting clocks in homes and clocks in shops. Then those clocks get transported to your wrists, or your pocket, actually, first. You carry a clock in your pocket. And the plot, those things tell you what time it is, but they also tell you what your work is supposed to do. And it's the work that regulates the time. And it's the work that regulates your life. So that you think not in terms of, oh, this task is going to take so long. It says, I have so much time to do this task. And suddenly, time becomes a commodity. You can save time. You can spend time. You can waste time. That wouldn't have made any sense to Elias de Stratton or any of his colleagues at that time. The apotheosis of this, I think, is the Fitbit. Not only does it, <laughs> does it calibrate minutes, seconds, many seconds, it also calibrates heartbeats, sleeping rhythms, brain waves. So there's no part of your life which is without regulation and without the discipline of time. It's that discipline of time that's taken centuries to impose. Those medieval villagers resisted and resisted and resisted. And the history of industrialization in the West, in, the, in Europe, is the history not only of the imposition of time, but the resistance of time. Thank you. So I think we have a PowerPoint presentation. And while that's happening, I want to thank Dean uh, Steele, Marx, and Marie Burke, um, and others for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. So I'm going to talk about time in pre-modern Islam. Pre-modern Muslims, it's fair to say, were obsessively and deeply engaged with time. So you might find a philosopher in 11th century Baghdad who, taught, who thought about the relationship between God and eternity. You might have a uh, 11th or 12th century uh, Persian scientist and inventor who spent lots of his, who spent a lot of time um, designing and building the best clocks and astrolabes of his era. And a 13th century Anatolian mystic who tried through his meditations to transcend time altogether. So in all of these sort of deep engagements with time, with defining it, with pondering its philosophical implications, with measuring it, um, you see sort of engagement across a range of disciplines in Islamic studies. So to talk in any serious way about time in Islam is to engage with art, 
art history, history of science, Quranic studies, philosophy, theology, and the list goes on. So what I'm going to do today is confine myself to four areas. I'm going to highlight intersections in terms of the study of the Quran, cosmology, Muslim cosmology, uh, history of science, philosophy, and mysticism. So that's quite a lot for the little time that I have, but I'll see what I can do. Uh, Islam, as some of you know, was born in 7th century Arabia. It's an area that's populated by pagans, Jews, Zoroastrians, and Christians. And to differentiate itself in this environment, Islam thoroughly and radically redefined time. For pre-Islamic Arabs, time, and the Arabic word, or an Arabic word for time, I should say, is dahar. For pre-Islamic Arabs, Dahar was a cosmic force of its own. It controlled what we might say is transient earthly happiness. It ushered an inevitable death. And we see an allusion to this kind of view in a Quranic verse that says, they say there is nothing but the life of this world. We die and we live, and nothing destroys us but time. So, in contrast to this, Islam imposed or asserted a theocentric worldview, a view that there was a, a monotheistic, omnipotent God who was the ultimate cause of all aspects of his creation. And that is uh, referenced in the second um, uh, report that I have there. It's attributed to the Prophet Muhammad. In addition to this theocentric view, or alongside it, I should say, um, there is this notion of an afterlife. So um, uh, Scott Wall alluded to it a little while ago, but essentially what, what Islam does is extend the time horizon, if you will, of a believer to just, you know, that this is not, it's not just this li the life of this world, but there is an afterlife to follow. And Islam also preached the idea that faith and actions were ultimately determinants of one's destiny in the hereafter and not just the passage of time that would control one's happiness or uh, sorrow. Now, alongside this, what I call a cosmological reconfiguration, or as part of it, Islam introduced a new calendar. Most of the communities of that time uh, adhered to what we might call a loony solar calendar, right? A lunar solar calendar that was roughly calibrated to the seasons. Um, so, I mean, for us in the northern, I mean, we follow a solar calendar. For us in the northern hemisphere, January is always a winter month. It was when I was young, it is now, and it will be when I am very, very old. A lunar, cal I mean, Islam Institute, a lunar calendar, and it's roughly 11 days shorter than the solar calendar. And what that means, essentially, is that the calendar is completely detached or unmoored from the seasons. So let's take the example of Ramadan, the holy month of fasting in Islam, when Muslims fast from sunup to sundown. Um, in my youth, Ramadan was in the fall, right, when the days are shorter, so the time that you have to fast is a lot shorter. Um, and now that I am 20, <laughs> um, I won't say how old I'm. Uh, Ramadan is in the summer months when the days are a lot longer. And so um, uh, Muslims might fast something like 16 hours, um, uh, 17 hours of the day. Um, in addition to this calendrical innovation or change, <clears throat> uh, there were a whole host of new rituals that were associated with the religion. So one of them is the five daily prayers, which are set at, um, which are recited at set times of the day. And um, they are also recited with a believer facing the Kaaba, which is in the city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia, the sacred center of Islam. And the introduction of all of these uh, rituals was against the backdrop of tremendous Muslim expansion. From the 8th to the 16th century, uh, the Muslim world expanded or grew out of its boundaries in Central Arabia. Um, in the west, it went all the way to Spain, in the east, to the borders of China. And so this, um, uh, these, this historical moment, or these eras, let's say, 
were accompanied by tremendous advances in sciences and technology, the need to navigate across this incredible expanse of land, and then for a believer, wherever they were, to have to figure out what the time of prayer is, when it is, and how you figure out where Mecca was um, or is, uh, resulted in sort of different types of advances in astronomy. And you heard last week that astronomy in the pre-modern period was a queen of sciences. So from about the 9th to the 16th century, Muslims were actually leaders in the area of astronomy. Um, there are incredible astrolabes and clocks um, that were invented in this time that just testify to the Muslim preoccupation with astronomy, with technological advancement, um, and also with absorbing a whole host of cultural influences as Islam expanded. Um, <clears throat> one of these people was the polymath, al Jazeera Ibn Razaz al Jazeera, who wrote this marvelous book that has been recently translated from Arabic into English, the book of knowledge of ingenious mechanical devices. And um, there are sketches in there and plans for all sorts of incredible devices that employed technologies um, that were uh, really advanced for that time, the 13th, uh, in the 13th century, 12th and 13th century. And one of these um, uh, ingenious mechanical devices was this awesome elephant clock. Um, it's also called the water castle clock, and it has been reconstructed in a mall in Abu Dhabi of all places. So if you're ever there, you can go see how it works. Um, but you can see from the clock that it incorporates a number of artistic influences from across the Muslim world. There's uh, um, uh, allusions to East Asian art um, and other geographic regions of the Muslim world. And I have this very short video because I am not an engineer or a scientist. I do <laughs> Islamic studies and history. I wouldn't be able to describe to you how this clock works if I tried, so this video will do it for you. Um, you can show the video. I don't know if I have to press something or... This elaborate clock has a display at the top showing the number of equal hours since sunrise <coughs> and marks every half hour with a wonderful display. It measures the passing of time using a bowl which floats on a water tank hidden inside the elephant's belly. The bowl slowly fills with water from a hole in its bottom and sinks every half hour. When the bowl sinks, it tugs a series of pulleys and mechanisms connected to the top of the clock. At the top of the clock, it tilts a channel of balls, causing one ball to be released. This causes the bird on the top to spin and causes the hour indicator to advance. The ball travels through the clock, falling from a falcon's beak into a tilting serpent. It causes a cymbal to sound and makes the elephant driver beat his drum and the body of the elephant. As the ball falls out of the elephant's mouth, the floating bowl is pulled back up and starts filling with water again for the next half hour. So, very impressive, right? I mean, as you can, and there were other clocks like this um, uh, across the Muslim world, actually. And you can get a sense of how these were not just mechanical devices meant to tell time. They were the celebration of a cosmopolitan global culture. They had an obsession with precision, with technological advancement, and with incorporating all kinds of artistic influences. Now, in addition to these, what I would say are practical, somewhat mundane concerns of keeping time, um, there were other Muslims who grappled with more abstract problems. Ninth and 10th century, no, ninth and 10th century um, uh, Muslims engaged with the ideas of Aristotle and other Greek philosophers who maintained that the world is eternal. Now, this idea actually doesn't sit quite well. It's not really compatible with the notion of creation of the cosmos at a fixed moment in time by a creator god. Uh, Muslims of the time who engaged with the Hellenic tradition were really impressed with the Hellenic tradition. They considered Aristotle to be actually somewhat of a Muslim philosopher, if you will, um, and they tried to integrate his thought into Muslim thought. And uh, philosophers like Avicenna, Ibn al-Arabi, articulated a whole host of questions and um, analytical frameworks 
for trying to reconcile Greek and Islamic philosophy. And they asked all sorts of questions. I've listed a few of them here, like what is eternity? Um, did it exist before God? Did God create time? Does time exist separate from God? Um, uh, as an aspect of his creation. And obviously, I am not going to talk about those philosophical discourses here, um, but I just wanted to sort of highlight that this area, that is time in the philosophical tradition, in the Muslim philosophical tradition, is a wonderful way to explore the shared histories and interconnectedness of Greek and Islamic philosophy. And I will just say in, in brief that one of the solutions that Muslim philosophers put forth was that time was indeed um, an attribute of God, a divine attribute like mercy and reason. They enumerated a whole host of attributes that were divine attributes, and time became one of them. So um, for some, uh, obviously, for some Muslims, philosophers, and theologians in particular, concepts and questions of time were to be tackled through intellectual or mental exertion. For the last group that I'll talk about, Muslim mystics, um, also known as Sufis, they took an entirely different angle. Um, for Sufis, time was an experiential challenge, not an intellectual one. Through rituals that involved music and dance, Sufis actually tried to embody eternity. So I'll give a very brief explanation here. In Muslim thought, right, the creation of Adam and human, all of humankind after him represents what we call the moment of a primordial covenant with God. It was a moment when humanity, attested to or submitted to divine will, and was in perfect harmony with it. Right? So Sufis, through their rituals, try to return to that moment of perfect harmony or union with the divine. And they do this through a whole host of meditations. Some are just invocations that are recited. Some are dances. Um, uh, and uh, one of the most well-known of these Sufi groups is that associated with Rumi, the internationally acclaimed uh, Sufi poet and philosopher. And his uh, brotherhood, his following is properly called the Mevlevi Brotherhood, but is prob popularly known as the Whirling Dervishes. And so, I want to very, very quickly play 30 seconds of this ritual as, in, as a, by way of concluding. Um, and it really doesn't do justice to the ritual, which goes on for more than an hour. Um, but I just want to give you a sense of how music, movement, and meditative focus come together in this ritual. Do I hear? <laughs> do it justice, but I hope you know that conveys a little bit of how through um, uh, this ritual, this meditation, Sufis aim uh, to transcend time and unify each individual attempts to unify with the divine. So um, in kind of through these broad brushstrokes of time in the Quran, in the history of science and philosophy and mysticism, I hope that I've um, sort of conveyed that there is no monolithic concept of time in Islam. Instead, it's much more appropriate to see time as something of a canvas, right? Where Muslims sort of contemplated and explored across the sciences, arts, and humanities. Thank you. Okay. Ah. For me, time is me. Time is as I move my hand. Time is between us. I am time. 
we are time. I think I might need the lights a little bit down because I think that it is just too bright overall. Please, thank you. Yeah, that's better. All right, I'll read a little. Many of us consider ourselves to be storytellers, perhaps even myth makers. And we all know that origin stories are powerful. We need as humans to understand who we are, where we come from, and to place ourselves in stories, in histories, and in time. My story and interest in the question of time begins in Mexico City, where I was born and raised to parents educated as chemical engineers. They instilled in me, that was funny, who did it? <laughs> that was very funny because I saw it as, <laughs> because yes, yeah, they're chemical engineers. I heard it back here. <laughs> oh, no worries. <laughs> because I find that funny. Uh, <laughs> and um, they instilled in me the uh, love of the, everything that I would ask, they would answer it with the tome of organic and inorganic chemistry. But it was, what was wonderful was that they instilled in me the love and the fascination for the natural world, and especially the nature of matter, its cycles, organization, all of its uh, uh, composition. So in a sense, they taught me to see matter in time. Um, I took this photograph in the late uh, 1980s with my first serious camera. And this is the jungles in uh, Guatemala, in the border with uh, Mexico, in a site, archaeological site called Piedras Negras. And it is Joquib um, in Maya, which means Great Gate. And my family loved going into um, archaeological digs. It was the, the passion of my father. So, so many times I lived just in the jungle for months and listening to the cicadas, listening to the holler monkeys, and just allowing time to be surrounded by this incredible jungle. But also at the same time, my father would teach me about the obsession of the Maya with, the, uh, with time in general, and specifically about the calendars and astronomy how they used three separate calendars, and they were connected in three cycles because they were cyclical calendars, how the Maya calendar system was not just a method to track various celestial cycles, but it was a complex system used to establish which of the many gods were ruling at each moment in their lives. The gods were constantly creating, controlling, renewing the world and all of the beings within it. So there was a fluid cyclical map of creation, a making and unmaking, and making and unmaking, and making and unmaking of all existence continually. So that sense of time was so instilled in me that it kind of, the idea of linear time, I've had such a hard time entering my brain. There was a time that I literally asked my husband, what century we were in, because that does not matter. It doesn't matter in my everyday, and so yes, um, time is going to be a problem for me. <laughs> I already can see it. Um, anyway, composer Karl Heinz Stockhausen said, we are transistors in the literal sense. People always think they are in the world, but they never realize they are the world. What Stockhausen means is that there are no phenomena in the natural world that do not manifest as vibratory or rhythmic phenomena. These vibrations attack us, they modulate us, and in the end become us. So we are time. With some of these ideas in mind, I created this series of works called uh, At Any Given Moment which they are captured with a 16, minute, 16 millimeter camera, film camera, so that I can have a materiality to the work. They are captured slightly uh, slower, they are 60 frames per second, and they are just of these moments where I found one element that was repeated and repeated and repeated 
but that the light and its modulation created incredible complexity. This is called at any given moment a, a fall one. And like that, I created six in the, uh, in the series. They get exhibited at very large scale, 22 feet by 19, with it's very dark, but it's about one ton of lava rock and gravel and sand in front of it. And that again, it is, I feel, the time I experience it in my body. I need to then create work that makes me be present and have a full embodied experience. I wrote here, I create work that makes me feel like I am in the very instant of the present. It is so easy to be in the mind, it is so easy to be anywhere else, everywhere else. And so in this way, I also create a, a, a place of repose of the soul. 20th century philosopher Henry Bergson has had a profound influence in my life and work. He believed that time was neither a real phenomenon, a, a real homogeneous medium, nor a mental construct, but possesses what he referred to as duration. Duration, in Bergson's view, was creativity and memory, as an essential component of reality. At the core, a lot of his ideas were in, terms, in thinking in terms of time rather than space. The very instant of becoming is the now, the moment of action, of the creative act, of change, of chance, of intuition. He said that being is in the past, and the present is pure becoming. So I explored this through getting a, a camera that was, you know, 60 65 years old, bollocks reflex that I cranked it with my hand. So I could have this sense of the apparatus being an extension of my body, and therefore I could not control everything. And thus the possibility of chance to happen, the possibility of my being able to, through the film perhaps, stopping and going, that I could have a more of a sense of the present. So in a way, my camera and I are becoming with each other. Oh boy, <laughs> I told you, time is going to be an issue. It's going to be an issue, <laughs> right? So uh, let me move to the next. With this work, I'm then pushing further this idea of the, uh, using the apparatus as the, the 16 millimeter, because it's a thick material presence that it has. In a way, this work, and I'm going to show you in this video. I'm looking, by using the 16 millimeter camera, I try to have you perhaps begin to see some of the oscillations and be, press, be, be, be aware of its materiality. And so it also evokes the idea of looking at looking. And so you can oscillate in the present moment. You will see that a lot of my work, I use 16 millimeter. And I'll move to the next. And I'm literally not even halfway, so I'm in trouble. This work, I'm exploring infinity. The idea that through the fog, the space that surrounds me, that sometimes I have this line, I can just go and then feel that there is, something is pulling me at the edges of the universe. And so for me, this is an exploration through light and void of that nothingness. And there's more photographs of this. And here, I consider the journey as a medium in itself. And I have produced large body of work just looking, going to extreme and unfamiliar spaces. This work is called walking. I have learned that by being in the play, sometimes waiting 12 hours, 24 hours for phenomena to act differently, to perhaps show me a moment of otherness, I live in a place where I can per perceive more precisely. And this project, I have myself, I film myself walking the earth. It's called actually, the project's called Walking the Earth. With this work, I will end it when I die. I will go everywhere I go 
and I will film myself crossing that horizon line. I want to see myself perhaps at one point with a little cane, but just going and experience my entire life walking the horizon. French philosopher Michel de Certeau argued that the practice of walking is analogous to the speech act and can also be understood to create a kind of uh, spacing or syntax in relation to how things are encountered. Walking and travel are described as a form of, enun of enunciation that carries the possibility of breathing life, introducing a temporal beat to the narrative. So artistic fieldwork is the closest to what I do as an artist in that I place myself in a situation where I go into the field, I go and experience the elements. Rather than being in the studio and trying to control everything, I need to have that relationship with the environment. An artistic fieldwork then is, is where you have the introduction of different fields of study. I could be collaborating with a geologist, a glaciologist, scientists that are exploring the earth, and then whatever you bring back it can be in any kind of artifact, from a film, a video, a book, a poem. And with that, I have created, I have traveled uh, um, to Svalbard, to the Arctic region, following the Arctic turn. And I'm going to speak about this project, Circumsolar, which is now becoming with. So if we were before speaking about this becoming in the moment of the present of Bergson, this idea of becoming with it's a little bit of Donna Haraway's idea of the, uh, the worlding together with other species. With Circumsolar, it's a long-term project with a growing body of artworks that emerge from my profound love of the Arctic turn. It's unwavering determination and the space it occupies in our earth and our, in our imagination. Every year, the Arctic turn, a small seabird flies from the Arctic to the Antarctic and back again, making its migratory journey the longest ever recorded. As a result, the Arctic turn experiences two polar summers in a year, which makes it the only creature in, that leaves the most daylight. That's a little, but you get a sense of its trajectory. So this is a project that I, it's a, it's a project that, again, it might be one that I will have my entire life that I'll be doing this project. This is a, I created a video that focuses on the Arctic terns um, uh, ma uh, mating and breeding season. But the Arctic tern is a cannery in the coal mine. It is basically, uh, in 2012 we collaborated with an ornithologist and 90% of the chicks are dying because of the way in which the water is warming up all around it. And it was exhibited at GLOW that Mark Pally was, is here, and he was the creative um, uh, artistic director of the show. And you can see it in my website. <laughs> it's called Circumsolar Migration One. And it focuses on the migration of humans, of all creatures, and that we must be in movement and in time. I think I'm just going to close. I'm going to skip completely two projects. And then this is an actual clock. So this is a mural for Metro, and it is 96 uh, 15 minute intervals where, um, and it, it is going to be installed in Metro in about a, a couple of months. I'm doing a dry, I just did a dry fit. But it is a day in Los Angeles. It's 96 moments of a day in Los Angeles. It's built out of tile, out of a very small mosaic. And that was only a few days ago, which was very exciting. So as storytellers and makers, we have an opportunity to change the conversation, to tell a story in self in relation, but not only at a planetary scale, but within, within the history of the universe what American historian David Christian calls big history. In the 13.8 billion year history of the universe, humans have only existed in the world for 200 years. As long as we do not have a sense of this big history, it will be very hard to understand ourselves as humans and that we share urgent problems that we need to work together with. Gracias. Thank you.
Thank you. Good evening, everyone. All right. My approach to time, as everyone else's is, is extremely personal. And uh, to really give an eye into my research, I have to give you a little bit of my past and how my life has impacted the way that I look at time. So I'd like to start by just uh, talking about a few things. Musical time changes from culture to culture. Seconds pass by in the same manner throughout the world. However, musical time is reflective of cultural influences and expressions. So one of the things I wanted to talk about first is a couple of concerts that occurred in New York City about a month apart when I was 29 years old. The first was at Carnegie Hall, and it was with Wynton Marsalis, Bobby McFerrin, uh, Anthony Davis, a uh, professor at UCSD now, a dear colleague of mine, and a number of young musical masters. It was called the Young Lions Concert. And the music that was played was modern jazz. And so one of the points is that the approach to time, metrical time, a steady pulse, was hyper-precise. Um, and the way that time was approached, you could spread your emotions over that hyper-precision. But one of the things that had to occur is the fact that everybody had to agree where the time was. You have to find that commonality. You have to come together, and you're taking in not only what people are playing technically, but you're also in taking what they are playing emotionally. Okay, the second concert, I was one of three soloists at Lincoln Center with the New York Philharmonic. I uh, walked out on the stage and um, amazing experience, and this concert was, yeah, I said Lincoln Center. The conductor gave his downbeat, and the orchestra came in slightly behind the beat. I said, oh, God. <laughs> you know. Thank God I didn't have to play that first chord. But one thing that I knew because classical music, a lot of it, the time, the way it unfolds, the tempo, the pace of it, is flexible to fit the particular emotions that exist within the composition. So I had to play in a very different way. I also had to perceive time in a different way than the experience with uh, Wynton Marsalis and Bobby McFerrin, and so on. So musicians, what do we do? Composers, what do we do? We learn different cultural approaches, and we bring them into what it is that we do. And I think one other very quick point. Time is like a mystic. You're chasing it. You want to learn more. You want to understand. You want to become more intimate with time, because the more intimate with time, the more profundity that can exist in your compositions and also your improvisations. So with that being said, what I would like to do is, could you play this video, please? We'll hear a few minutes of it. I should let you know this is an incredible Senegalese composer, Dudu Njai Rose. And this is his ensemble. And one of the things that happens, can you turn it up a little bit? You gotta feel it. 
There you go. He's calling the ensemble. They're getting up. He's letting them know. He says, he doesn't say, okay, the rehearsal's going to begin. He calls them with the sabar. On the side, that's what we call a topos. That's a short, rhythmical phrase, and all of the music is built around that. stop it. Ugh. But you can find it online. It's D-O-U-D-O-U in apostrophe D-I-Y-A-E rose. And it's called the rose rhythm. Did you hear a lot of rhythms stacked on top of one another? We call those polyrhythms. Guess what's really important? The rhythms speak to one another. This communication is so essential. It's, it's such a key part of African music where you have multiple rhythms that are speaking to one another and they're all stacked up and they're in communion with one another. So, um, so let's look at this. When I think about time in music, I think about it primarily in three ways. On the level of the individual, you can get a wide range of the most profound aspects of the human condition communicated by the way you approach the beat. We're going to talk about that with Billy Holiday in a second. On the communal level, you know, it brings groups of people together. That's what you just saw in that ensemble. They have agreed upon the pulse, right? Otherwise, you stack all of the rhythms on top of one another, and it's like, you know, it's moving all over the place. It's not working, you know. And finally, I perceive it as a continuous universal calibration that allows us to connect every aspect of creation, no matter how close or far from mi micro to macro and infinity. What I'm trying to say there is I'm composing pieces now that are images from the Hubble telescope. They're giving me the form. And if we think back to the beginning of the 20th century, Claude Debussy was buying Japanese woodcuts in Paris because he was so intrigued with those images. And he figured out a way to take those images and move those images and put them in his sound world where you could hear Japan in his orchestral works, in his piano music. Isn't that fascinating? Now, 120 years later, I can look at images of the Hubble telescope and compose. It always pushes me to new territory that I've never discovered before. I'm finding new harmonies, new rhythms, new ways of approaching form. And then I think of the rhythm of the image and the distance, okay? How long does that image, how much time passes before that image 
hits the telescope and we can then download it and see it and receive these amazing, powerful lessons. Now I have to go to Duke Ellington because jazz is a huge part of who I am, even though now almost all of my music is completely notated, written for classical musicians. But what I'm trying to do in my research is taking the time of the improviser, the time of the African, and the time of people from all over the world that I've had the honor to perform with and move that into a fully notated context. And what Ellington said that was so powerful, he says, I, he says, it is music when he defines jazz with an African content that comes out of an American environment. So it's all of the cultures coming together and mixing with that African root. That's what I want to compose. That's what I'm coming out of. And communities thrive on the ability to interact within a shared internal pulse. How can this shared pulse be organized? How does it function? How does its function change from one culture to another? Really intriguing questions. And we talked uh, a little bit about a lot of African derived music has an, uh, sort of what they call a clave, right? A key. So you have a rhythm like Have you heard that before? Okay, it's called a son clave. The music is structured around that. It holds it together. You can add all of the elements um, to the basic rhythms that you're building on. As, as Dudu and Jai Rose went to the side of the drum to give the clave for that piece, then the other rhythms were able to stack on top of it. That's, that's, that's an amazing thing about this music. So now, this is due to in, in, in Jai Rose right here. Uh, a great master, one of the great composers in the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century. And um, he left us about, yeah, he died in 19, I mean 2015. Now, this is it right here. <laughs> this is the stuff. Okay. I got to rush. So that means that I'm, I'm going to have to talk you through this very quickly. What Billie Holiday did, and please go and listen to her. We won't have time to play. I'm going to ask you to stand up real quick, real quick. I want you to lean forward. Do you feel the energy like you want to go forward like that? That's the head of the beat. <laughs> you become anxious. Uh, you're really excited about something. I always uh, use the image of two people that love each other so strongly and they haven't seen each other in three months and they're running towards each other in the airport. <laughs> Okay, that's a good one. On the beat, you go to concerts. Let's say you're going to a hip hop concert, a funk concert, and you see the heads all moving to the tempo. Everybody's body's moving. All the students know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> that gives you a sense of community. You all come together. You want to be one, you know, and that's really important. Now I want you to just lean back slightly. Sadness, tragedy, pain, sorrow. Billie Holiday would start a phrase like this, and by the time she got to the end of one phrase, she was like that. And that had to do with her incredible sophistication and number crunching and having this hypersensitive relationship to the beat where she can really play and toy with the emotions. 
I wish I could play you some of my music, but I'm out of time. Please, let's play, let's play. Yeah, no, no. Victoria no. said we can play. Yes, please, let's play. Okay, I'll do it really quickly. I feel like I should play Billie Holiday, but... Um, Um, I'll play you a little bit of Amazing Grace. Um, some pieces, oh, I'm torn between that and the, the Orion Nebula. <laughs> but I guess I'll go traditional. Um, this arrangement came when um, the tragedy happened at Emanuel AME in Charleston. And President Obama, the president at that time, sang Amazing Grace at the funeral of Clementa Pinckney. Uh, how many of you remember that moment? A number of you do. I was so moved by that moment that I wrote an arrangement for string orchestra of Amazing Grace, and uh, we recorded it. And uh, can you please uh, hit the uh, audio? And it's, it's in time, but it gives you the feeling just spectacular together um, and and with an with an idea that that with the time we have we're going to open the conversation to everybody in the room in just a moment I thought it, prior to doing that if there was anything that might resonate across the, the presentations as you listen to them that you'd want to to speak about first I think I'm I'm incredibly struck by the extent to which each of you presented this idea of time as a kind of experience, maybe in the, in the most extreme version, as you, as you said, with the Sufi and mystic idea that time is, time is a part of our experience of the world. And each of you touch on this in really interesting ways, historical, personal, in terms of it being a, a, a part of a world to arrange. I, I'm curious if there's anything in, in the presentations that you were thinking of as someone else might have been talking about their own ideas or experiences. Yeah, I mean, I think that 
you know, one of the things that really stood out for me, of course, is that, um, you know, we are under this time regime hmm. now, right? I mean, we are very much disciplined by time. Um, uh, we are told to live by it. But it seems to me that other cultural constructions of time um, that we have heard about here actually allow in different ways much more of that ex a fuller experience of time, as it were, um, uh, you know, through music or photography or the mystical mm -hmm. experience, where you can actually be in the moment yeah. in ways that our time <laughs> regimen here doesn't allow us to be mm -hmm. in the moment. So, um, it, you know, all of these presentations really help me think about those cultural constructions mm -hmm. of time. And for me, for example, it was incredible how we can be talking about time, but the moment that we actually feel it is like the moment that you, we, you started playing the piece. Not only I was very aware of what you became, right? Because you suddenly, it's like, it's like you were inhabited by the time that we're talking about. And, and I entered into a different place. It's as if there is only a very limited part of us that exists when we are speaking about something. And then we become something so different mm -hmm. when we allow ourselves to actually experience it fully with our entire body. And then we are in that present. Mm -hmm. And then we become, and then we're creative. So I think that that was so, so clear that I, I felt that. One thing I really learned is that from everyone's presentation is that we can step out of the time that we feel constricted to yeah. and yeah. live in other ways. Yeah. I think in everyone's mm -hmm. presentation, and sometimes it's connected to God, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as you were speaking about the feast and so on and, and being gathered around this, and also thinking about Rumi, yeah. and um, mm -hmm. and just how all of us, it, a lot of times it connects to God, the different ways that we see God, and then just this gift of realizing that we have to get off of this conveyor belt that's just going too darn fast right now occasionally, <laughs> and figure out another way to go. And how yeah. do we access it? How do we get there? Mm -hmm. um, from what I learned in everyone's presentation is that there are a number of avenues available for that yeah. experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a number of different cultural or historical frames by which to understand that experience. Mm -hmm. Scott, one of the things you, you touched on in, in, in your summary of a kind of agrarian pre-industrial notion of time as a lived experience is is that there was a kind of unifying, what emerges is a kind of unifying of work routines and tasks and, and behavior or social life to a great degree. And, and you know, one of the things that that begs is questions around the limits of that as a kind of project. The Fitbit being maybe the current contemporary example, but, but the sort of broader question that it opens up about the ways in which we can each, not just individually, imagine ways to step out of time, but also maybe in larger collective or social settings. Well, I think it's important to, I, I, in that respect, I would look at the sort of the university. Yeah. And if you think about the university, actually, it, it has different time regimens. And there is a kind of factory time, which staff and administration experience, which is governed by the clock and governed by mm -hmm. very strict uh, time. Then there's student time, which whether you like it or not, is kind of pre-modern. Uh, <laughs> you do the tasks, you don't, you know, you, you can go to class, you don't have to go to class, you don't do the class, you don't read each chapter according to time, but you kind of do it at the last minute at 2 a.m. Yeah. So there's a, there's a kind of rhythm that is hmm. dictated by the work that you do. And then there's, I think, what's most fascinating is faculty time, which is, um, you know, the, I've always felt that the one thing that the university has to do, above all, its main mission is, is to protect in our world, our yeah. modern world, the time for reflection. Uh, it's, a it's the most precious commodity. Mm -hmm. And yeah. reflection, I think, is a kind of timelessness in our culture, mm -hmm. where there's a bubble where you let your mind go, you be in the moment, um, 
And I think we've seen really mm. superb examples of what happens when people reflect and are able to use that reflection to express something. But that's not factory or industrial time. It's not Fitbit time or whatever it might be. And I think that's, if you think about what the use of the university is, it, it encompasses all those things. And that's what you know, I think mm. is especially valuable. And we've seen brilliant examples of just what it is that that use of time does. I don't like the term use of time because <laughs> you, I don't think you, these people are, you're using time, you're using your reflection. Okay. So anyway, that's random thoughts. Yeah, another yeah, sure. another really striking yeah, yeah, sure. um, convergence across the presentations for me was, was the, the ways in which you, in, in different moments, touched on a kind of infinite time, what is thought of as an eternity or eternal mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm wondering the extent to which that, I, I'm curious about that as an idea in your own lives and, and how you see the work you're doing now in a longer arc of a career or a form of research or an ongoing project and how you've experimented with that over the course of your careers. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's interesting for me, I mean, I think for all academics, we think about our writing and our research, our, our scholarly production as something that will enable us to hmm. connect with an eternal, right? Your writings outlive you, your, your works and that, your compositions outlive you, right? But I have to say that, you know, that is something that I only think about when really pushed to it. I mean, the, the moments in which I actually think about eternities when I think about Islamic philosophy, for example. I mean, it really is a very abstract mm. notion for me. Um, and that's why it was interesting for me to think about the Muslim mystics um, and the ways in which, <clears throat> um, you know, through a particular ritual, I mean, this, there is this idea that you can actually experience eternity. I mean, like you can experience time. You can experience the past, the present, and um, a future uh, moment of happiness through this, you know, through an embodiment, through a ritual. So I found that interesting. But beyond that, I have to say, university time, I am very much in the moment. What do I have to do next, right? Huh. The time panel I have to go to. And then there's a reception. So, I mean, that's, I think that's how most of our days are lived. <laughs> that um, in, in a few projects I have looked for that specific idea of infinity like you know you mm. see those photographs and then the um, nothing further happens video in which I'm really kind of uh, meditating on the idea of the sublime but in terms of the disappearance of oneself or like that connection of oneself with the earth so it's truly the dissolution of of a sense of individuality and becoming matter and becoming you know more universal and i think of you know when i think of the universe when i think of laniakea right the, the, this incredible understanding that we have of everything as the corners of it it's when i think of that infinity but it does not include me as a human as much, right? It includes it as a, a thought because immediately I come back like, like a yo-yo and come back to extinction and what we're doing with the planet. And that I don't see us as, a, as, as living beings with that sense of, you know, in, in, in unlimited existence. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it really puts me exactly at what was it that the the humans existed only in what's the equivalent of the last millimeter of the last mm. square of a toilet paper roll, right? If, you, if we consider the existence of the universe, that little, little, little thing is us. So when I think infinity, I think more geologically and universal, not necessarily as existence as humans. And so therefore I do feel immediately boom, our finality. First of all, even before I comment, I just want to say how moved I was by your images. The images Absolutely. of infinity were just so touching. I just wanted to stand over here and start crying. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and from everyone, uh, it's just been a really beautiful, profound experience. Um, I have to say I'm thinking about eternity daily. Hmm. And the reason 
is twofold. Um, my faith is my life. And it impacts everything that I try to do when I come to this institution to give the best of what I have. My faith informs me. When I go home and I have the time to compose, it's an offering to God. Yeah. And I feel that when I'm in that room, I'm visited. And it, the visitation informs the music. The visitation guides mm -hmm. the music. It leads the music. Um, and I set texts from the Old Testament, the New Testament. I've sort of turned my back on the commercial world years ago. <laughs> and this is the only thing I want to do. And I just came back from a conference at the Vatican. I was invited by the, the head of culture for the Vatican. And the conference was amazing. People from 36 countries coming together to talk about music and God, words and God. And you come back from that experience and being at Assisi, you know, where St. Francis is buried. Uh, hmm. And I think about Mahalia Jackson, uh, the great gospel singer who could have sang any music that she wanted to, including opera and so many other forms, but everything she did was an offering to God. So I figured I was so crazy and so bad when I was young, I've got to do better now. <laughs> 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 nice. <laughs> Wonderful. I think it's time for us to open up the conversation to everybody in the room. If we can do that. We've got a couple of microphones in the room. I see a question right up here up front. Yep. Let's see if we can get a microphone over here. Oh, okay. Hello. Um, so I think you guys all gave like a very marvelous like summary of your own idea of time, which I was really moved by each and every single one of them. But I was wondering, time is such a vast topic. Like anyone could agree that time is vast and they usually take, like if you ask someone with all of these 10 questions, you ask like, what is time? What is beauty? What is space? And everyone kind of pauses for a second and they don't know quite how to answer. Would you agree that one of the reasons why it's very difficult to I don't know, express or define or give a very like clear answer to what is time is because we as humans don't have enough time to even begin <laughs> to like start <laughs> explaining what we're trying to say. <laughs> and how was it that you guys like managed to summarize all of your things? Because I noticed some of you were like trying to rush through and I could tell you didn't want to, but how did you manage to like crunch it all into like a small <laughs> space of speaking time? Obviously I failed. <laughs> it seems that mine went on and on. <laughs> um, well, I think that it's just the moment that you know that you're basically having a glimpse at something. I mean, really, even, even what we said, it's a glimpse of, of a of what someone can be doing the rest of their life. I mean, I think that for some of us, our thinking of time has really been all our lives. And so now mm -hmm. it's more like, okay, let's kind of like a lick of a cat, like that's what you got, because <laughs> that's very, very little. But, um, but it's, um, for me, it's like being in, trying to figure out what does it mean to me in this instant. Anyone else on the panel about this question of how did you do it? How did you get it down to 10 minutes? Well, look, I mean, I don't, I don't have an answer for how did I get it down to 10 minutes, but, <laughs> but um, just to continue on something that we touched on before, I have to confess that when I first received this invitation, um, the only thing that came to my mind were um, jokes about Pakistani standard time and Middle Eastern <laughs> standard time. That's like what you use when you're always that would late, be so right? Funny. Um, but <laughs> here. Uh, and so I, I thought, what, what am I going to say um, for 10 minutes? But 
Um, it really was an opportunity for me to explore um, all of these interdisciplinary connections, some of which was I was unaware of. I was mostly aware of time and um, Islamic philosophy. But um, I thought one of the things that I want to do in this panel um, is to show the interdisciplinary nature of engagement with time across a religious civilization. And I thought, you know, what are some of the things that I can pick that would be appropriate hmm. for this um, uh, for this type of a setting, and how can I just get it down to two minutes per thing? <laughs> so, <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. I chose the three musical examples sort of first and then started thinking about it more. Did any of you have a chance to listen to the musical examples? A few of you did, great. Um, I also wanted to include uh, Japanese gagaku music hmm. because there is a, a sense of floating at times about how the music unfolds and uh, the deep meditation that uh, the music is based on in part and just the, the profundity of the sound and at times it's almost like the sound is swirling in the room and if you get that kind of feeling you're mm. going to go somewhere <laughs> else very quickly <laughs> you know and, and uh, how that happens all over the world has really fascinated me so then after thinking of the three musical examples it was more an trying to not spread too wide and just try to keep it fairly focused and I also failed. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. Not at all. <laughs> it's hard, it's really hard. Yes, please. Um, again, I, I really enjoyed the, the, the talk and uh, it reminded me a lot about some of the elements that came up in last week's with space. Mm. And my question is, uh, do you see time, uh, for, especially since your disciplines, is time in some ways, is it the canvas on which you do your work, you know, as a musician, as a photographer, as a filmmaker, as a historian, or is time itself um, uh, a tangible thing, or is it just a relationship of ideas, and is, uh, you know, so no, is it, do you see it as a very objective thing or a subjective thing? Where does it lie? And also, I just wanted to chide you for not having your astrophysicist here, because if you're going to talk about, you know, wow. time. Uh, so just that relationship, do you see time as some actual tangible thing? Yes. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> There's a great blues line by Robert Johnson. And it starts, I woke up this morning and I saw the blues walking down the street. Mm -hmm just like a man, what a blues, give me your right hand. Mm -hmm. So the rhythm of, of the lyric, you know, he's giving you a tangible yeah. image. He's taking the blues and, and he's turning it into a person. And all of that happens while mm -hmm. he is singing with one rhythm, playing rhythm guitar with another rhythm, and playing lead guitar with another rhythm. Mm -hmm. So just think about what you'd have to do to have your brain do all of that at the same time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so it's tangible and it's also uh, abstract, both. Wonderful. Yeah. Let's carry on with the, yes, right here? Sorry, I don't mean to be in one area of the room. We're going to spread it out a little bit, but. Hi. So Thank you all for speaking. My question is directed mostly to the two artists on the panel, and I was just curious, the thing that struck me the most about what everyone said, but specifically the two of you, was time, or art as a way of stepping outside of time and the sort of constraining element that our modern conception of that has on our daily lives. And I was curious, though, that even we see art as sort of a profession that exists outside of that, but it does still exist in a capitalistic art market that has a demand for labor and traded time. And so I'm curious about how you, at, like in your practices, how you guys deal with that, if you have any strategies or advice. I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing in terms of, um, it's almost like I want to answer a combination of the how do I experience time and 
because so, so many times in my life somebody has come and said, well, what you do is like, it's not real life, right? It's just, and, and all I can think is like, well, you make the life you want. And so in terms of the living or being, you know, you know is, is, life, is time a real thing? It's like, as I mentioned in my talk, it's like, I am time. So there isn't, it's, it's as real as I can be. And I can be real sometimes and I can be very unreal at other times. So it, it's, it's so much about where, what you want to do with your life, how do you schedule it, that you cannot say, when I have time, I'm going to do art, or when I have time, I'm going to, no. It is what it is. It's like, I cannot help it. I have to be making it. Mm. Otherwise, there is like no air inside of me. So you have to live it, breathe it. On the other hand, is there a time where I can actually step out and stick to a timeline, like for a talk, <laughs> right? So if for me, I have the other, the other problem is that can I actually you know, step to do certain <clears throat> things that are very pragmatic and that, and that I really would be measured? It's like, no, it's all fluidity. And sometimes you're going to pay a bill right here and gee, you're not making art right here. And it's just, I'm more like this thing. In <laughs> yeah, and, and so that is. <laughs> There isn't such thing as compartmentalization when you are an artist, I think. Yeah. Real yeah. quick. <laughs> <laughs> it's about your self-discovery as an artist. And really finding out who you are and what you have to say that differentiates you from every other artist on the planet and try to be as great as you possibly can. So mm -hmm. many people think about the business of art and mm -hmm. visual art. It's such a big deal now, you know, yeah. with the people that have made a lot of money from the stock market going in, investing in art that mm -hmm. becomes uh, very fashionable. Then they run onto someone else and someone else. So if you aim for the timeless, mm -hmm. you are free. That's beautiful. Yes, 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 yes. Wonderful. Over on this side, I see a hand. Yeah. Um, I'd like to thank, say thank you all again. And um, to you, what role does timelessness, timelessness play in the scheme of time? I'm sorry, was that? I, I think that's open to anyone on, anyone on the panel. What, ro what role does timelessness play? in your own lives or your own work? Hmm. I mean, you just said it. It's freedom. It is freedom. It, that it, 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 I mean, I, it, it's... Uh. I mean, one thing that I've realized from this panel is um, that um, musicians, artists, um, uh, people who live in the creating realm in ways different from um, what I do is um, are those who really experience time and probably timelessness far more fully than I have ever had the blessing to do so. Because for me, time is essentially, it's a clock. It's something that is um, ultimately can be very oppressive. And so, um, you know, to think about experiencing timelessness, as I think you both have, is not something that I have given much time mm. to, I have to say. Well, <laughs> nice, but nice. probably, I, but I, I think that's probably not entirely true, because I think that one of the things is time becomes oppressive in our society. I mean, it's, and this goes back to the question of the, uh, the young woman asked. It, it, it is constantly present. You're constantly reminded of it, whether you like it or not. And you're constantly trying to configure your life against it, for whatever it is, because of deadlines or because of needs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so the, the project of stepping out of time becomes, I think, priceless. And I think that, that can be, happen in many different ways. You can, it's living in the moment where there is no time, where time is eternal, uh, which are perhaps synonymous. Or living in a state of rhythm where you lose the sense of not the uh, 
you're, you're so immediate in timing that you lose a sense of the larger context. So I think that notion, I think we all aspire to stepping out of time, of not being oppressed and finding ways in which we can do that. You can do it in, in reading, and you know, when you're really studying yeah. about something, That's yeah. true. you can lose where you are. Yeah. I mean, I, I mm. can go into an archive and spend a day there and forget how many, what, you know, it's not dictated by the hours I was there, it was dictated by the project. And it's yeah. that project which is, I mean, it's boring and tedious for everybody else, but for me, it was really <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> and uh, so I think that that's, so I think we all, and I, I think that's the modern dilemma in a lot of ways, is trying to find that way in which you're not oppressed by time, which time is not dictating everything you're doing. And the more you can do that, I think the better off you are. And I, it, but it's singular. It's, it, it, it can be through music, it can be through art, it can be through scholarship, it can be through sitting in the park, I don't know. But um, I think that becomes a project for all of us, which is to, to not become enslaved by time, yeah. because it, it is the modern dilemma. And can I just add to this, because I think that as we're thinking about it, it just occurred to me that for me, it is the, the creative act feels timeless. Intuition feels timeless, mm -hmm. and it is it comes in leaps. It's not that you build in, in towards it. Sometimes you can create the conditions and not get there. And sometimes you're washing dishes and you have that moment of boom, almost like a knowing in totality or something that just feels, ah, it's as if this opens up. And so timeless, it has no measure. It more is an intensity. And I do think that I feel that that intensity can happen at yes. any moment. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. it just doesn't happen in an artist's residency of two months. And sometimes it really happens when I am petting my cat. So it's just, it, when does it happen? When does that creative moment happen? So that, I would say, is the timeless for me. Uh, up, up top here in the middle here, there's Right here in the middle, sorry. They're bringing a microphone over. My question follows kind of along the lines of the gentleman earlier about the astrophysicist. But uh, an observation I have was a lot of the, the presentations kind of saw time through kind of a human perspective as a stage or a measuring tool to how we organize or measure our lives or humanity, either our personal interactions with our lives or how humanity organizes. Um, nice. From more the other side, you know, again, as our, the, the lady said, you know, humanity is just the very end of the toilet paper roll. Mm -hmm. But to, as time being the whole entity of eternity, that's a separate perspective, I wonder if you have anything to comment on the different types of time. Like I said, we've been focusing more on the human, how do we use it, how do we organize it. In a greater realm, how might that be uh, looked at? I can answer a little bit. I, I have, um, I, and I think that it's interesting because so much of my work is about time. So I have portraits of mountains, for example, and I just set the camera and sometimes it's like 48 <laughs> hours of a portrait of a mountain. And so I think that to me, maybe that is, still is my point of view, it's, um, um, it's my eye, but I am looking at more geological time, which, or maybe atmospheric time really, because Nothing moved of the mountain, but <laughs> the clouds did move. Um, the bird, right, when I'm looking at the Arctic turn, a lot of the times it is for me is animal time. I am actually trying to world with it, and I'm, trying, I, and I'm camping with the, with, the, with the bird, and I'm, in order for me to film it with the bollocks, I have to learn the pattern, because once I shut the, the, the shutter speed, I cannot see anything. So I'm learning when is it going to actually dive to go eat. So I think that our times combine. And so for me, I think that if anything is less my time and more its time, 
whatever I'm filming, whatever I'm documenting, even the time of the apparatus, I'm more interested in how the machine is going to actually do its thing. So I try to, to, to let go of my own time. And there's times that I've cried of exhaustion because there is nothing is happening. Nothing further happens. And I'm like, ah, I'm running out of film, and I'm like, I can't do this. <laughs> so it is something that I am a slave of this time, other time. And I enjoy that being taken away and ripped out of my humanity, if I, if I could say. I think I'm inspired by women and men <coughs> who have been looking at eternity maybe through a, um, a combination of art and science that are guideways to begin to take in the possibilities of eternity. Uh, and I can think of a, a, a number of artists, uh, whether they're uh, in music or visual art, literature, uh, but I, I, be I really believe that uh, the integration of the sciences with art mm -hmm. is going to be a very important evolution for humanity. Just how it comes together to new, in new ways to embrace the possibilities that exist of eternity. Mm -hmm. There's so much more that we have to learn. We are such babes, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. you know? And particularly when we begin to view eternity, you know, it, it, it's it's like if I had my druthers, there's a huge part of me that would have loved to have been an astrophysicist, yeah. but there weren't many in my neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. But um, I just uh, because that's an important part. It, it's like I have to study physics more to do the next projects that I really want to do. And it's finding the time to approach that eternity. And I really appreciate you bringing that up because it's so yeah. important for humanity. Mm -hmm. Th thank you. And, and um, in that we're coming to the end of our time, <laughs> I thought maybe we could close it and to see if any of you might have any closing statements Anything you'd like to say that kind of tries to draw a thread between a few of the points up to now? Osma, you were about to say something. Actually, I was going to just respond to that question. Okay. If I can do that instead of a, a closing statement, that would be, that'd be good. Um, I mean, I think that uh, not just Islam, but world religions do a great job of this, of unsettling um, human beings from their current perception and rootedness in time and having them think about eternity. Um, and I mean, if you look in the Quran, there are, and in Islamic literature, there are 25, 30 different words for time, measuring it in different ways, mm. and talking about this idea of an eternity, and talking about what a day is, you know, in the eyes of God, and in, you know, in um, sort of the Old Testament, and the New Testament, and the Quran, um, the lifespans of certain prophets, like um, what Moses lived, what, 900 years? I, I, right. I mean, I don't remember his, but, um, hmm. you know, there's just this, I think all of the world religions constantly try to unsettle sort of regular human perceptions of time and have us think about eternity, pre-eternity, and then extend our time horizons um, uh, to an afterlife. Thank you. Scott, Rebecca, either of you closing? Go ahead. Yeah. You will have something more interesting to say than I No, no, no. no. <laughs> but I have said so many things. I will say it, but maybe after you. <laughs> no. All right, so then I'll go. Um, I have collaborated with geologists and with glaciologists, ornithologists, but it is something that for me, I agree, it's like I, one of my very, when I was young, when I was about, I don't know, 14 or so, I went to NASA and I wanted, mm -hmm. I was sure I was going to be an astronaut. And because I continued to 
have that desire of expansion yeah. and just understanding the sense of the universe extent and duration, not just you know the, the, the extent. So I know that you know I, I've been studying like you know Laniakea again, just the universe itself, and it's just so amazing the concept. When I feel that I am kind of getting a sense of getting a little bit lost, I just have that image of that universe and the way in which we are trying to map that infinity, mm -hmm. and it's so inspiring. So for me, it's like the collaboration with science again. It's, it's it inspires mm -hmm. me so much, so much. And I feel that that's where I feel the um, both, um, and, and our relationship to animals, for example. For me, the post-human, the idea of, I do believe that our humanity is going to come from my relationship with wild animals. Mm -hmm. So that is another way of entering another universe. So it's in one way very far, and on the other hand, is like, what is our humanity? Because we have lost that connection. We're very isolated. Francisco Toledo. Sí, claro. <laughs> Definitivamente. Yeah. Okay. Scott, last word. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I guess my, the, the, what I was trying to say was that what we, the way we live today, where our conception of time is a construct, and it's a construct that's been imposed of, on us through a lot, many, many years, knowing that doesn't allow us to deconstruct it. But knowing it does, um, should free us to do projects which either work against that construct or allow us to escape that construct in different ways. And I think that it's, it's vital that we understand that we, that our notion of modernity is it's been fashioned through industry and factories and a variety of other things through stopwatches and watches and trying to tell better time is a regime which we brought on ourselves as humans. Mm -hmm. And that we're all, as victims of it, too busy, too harried, too stressed. And we need to understand that it is a regime we've brought on ourselves. It's not the regime of Arctic turns. It's not the mm -hmm. regime of rhythms. Mm -hmm. It's not the regime mm -hmm. of even the mechanical clocks of elephants. So <laughs> I think it's important to understand that and understand what it is and then understand the ways we get out of it and into the moment. Wonderful. Thank you. And, and everybody in the room, please join me in thanking our guests for their time. <laughs> by my, by my okay. back of envelope calculations, if there's 300 of us in the room, we've just spent 600 hours together. <laughs> the most delightful 600 hours, I think, of the week for me, most certainly. Um, join us next week for What is Beauty? Look beauty. forward to seeing you Wonderful. all then. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad you asked me to do that. Yes. <laughs>